We looked at the PKPD of vancomycin and determined the loading dose. We use IDSA guidelines and population kinetics to determine an empiric dose and frequency. We also looked at vancomycin levels to select individualized vancomycin dose and frequency. We also looked at vancomycin dosing in intermittent hemodialysis. Now the next learning objective is given a patient receiving vancomycin, approximate vancomycin AUC. So remember that AUC is for a 24 hour period of time. Uh, in this example, we're showing you a Q8 dosing of vancomycin. So on the horizontal axis, you have time. So it goes from time zero to time 24. And on the vertical axis, we have vancomycin uh, concentration in the blood. If you give this vancomycin dose three times a day or Q8, so you get a peak uh, three times. And the area under all of these uh, would be considered the AUC uh, for 24 hour period. Now, if you get a single level, if you get just a trough, the question is, can you estimate how much the AUC would be? So because the AUC is the area of um, under the curve, if you have a trough of 10, you can say that this level never goes be below 10. So you can say that the area under the curve is at least 10 times 24, which is 240. So this area is at least 240. And then you also have all of these uh, areas at the top, which we don't know because we don't know what the peak is. So that's the issue. When you only get trough, you, you, you don't really know what the true uh, peak is. So it only allows you to estimate what the AUC is. So we know that the AUC is at least 240. And remember that we want the AUC to MIC ratio to be at least 400. So if the MIC happens to be one, we need an AUC of uh, 400. Now this highlighted area is at least 240. So we're hoping that all of this area at the top is at least 160 uh, to add up to 240. And uh, you know, so, so that's where the recommendation of gold trough of 10 to 15 come from. Um, uh, so in an, in a non-serious infection, if you have, uh, you know, 10 to 15, so of course, if you have 15, 15 times 24 will give you 360. So now 360 is close to 400. And of course, we have all of these area at the very top. So I'm actually very confident that a trough of 15 will achieve 400. So for a non-serious infection, the, uh, the old guidelines recommend a trough of 10 to 15. And they're saying that if you achieve a trough of 10 to 15, you probably had an AUC of at least 400. You know, you can be confident. Now, in a, uh, if you have a trough of 20, 20 times 24, it's at least 480. So you definitely have achieved the AUC of, of uh, at least 400 because you also have all of these areas. So at the very minimum, you have 480 plus all of these. So a trough of 20 is an overkill so you definitely uh, you know achieved an AUC of uh, more than um, uh, 400 now the the thing is if you do between 15 and 20 so 15 is would give you 360 and 20 would give you 480 so for serious infections they said if you target the trough of 15 to 20 you're basically guaranteed to have an AUC of uh, 400 and that's where those recommendations are coming from which uh, you know which uh, you know in the case of 15 to 20 uh, could actually be um, overdosing now let's see the correlation between trough to AUC so this these guidelines from 2009 and 2011 said that uh, you know you can use trough as a surrogate for AUC because we know AUC is the PKPD target for efficacy. So AUC actually determines efficacy. Trough really doesn't mean anything for efficacy. Trough only is meaningful for safety, which we will talk about in a little bit. But for efficacy, trough doesn't mean anything. So what they, what they said was that they're actually using it as a surrogate for AUC, which is the actual parameter for safety. And they said that's because there is a significant correlation between trough and AUC. And when they said uh, it's a significant, uh, what they meant was that this is a you know statistically significant. So, uh, so in this graph on on the horizontal axis, 
we're looking at the vancomycin trough and the, on the vertical axis we're looking at AUC and here you have a scatter plot and then you can actually get a, a uh, get a Spearman uh, P and correlation coefficient so the correlation coefficient or R is 0 0.43 which means there's a there's a 43 or let's say there's a 44 percent correlation between trough and AUC which is horrible that's that's uh, worse than a coin flip so there's only a 43 correlation uh, between trough and AUC and if you get the uh, coefficient of determination which is r squared uh, is only 19 percent so that means uh, only 19 percent of variation in AUC is determined by uh, by trough and the p-value for it was significant so they said it, there's a significant correlation between trough and AUC but nevertheless, it's, it's not a very good uh, correlation because it's less than 50%. So what else can we do to estimate AUC if trough is not really a good uh, surrogate for AUC? So one thing that you can do is use the general equation AUC equals dose uh, divided by clearance. So especially if you have uh, two levels and you actually calculated the clearance in the patient, uh, you, know, you know the dose and you know the clearance, you can actually get the AUC. And now empirically, when you're just starting the dose, you can't really know the clearance in the patient from levels because you, have, you haven't received levels yet. So you can actually use uh, population kinetics. So there's this equation, the moist brother equation um, that was actually derived from their patient population uh, that can actually estimate what the AUC would be uh, empirically. So imagine you wanted an AUC of 400 and you know the patient's creatine clearance, you basically solve for dose and that will give you the empiric dose that will give you the AUC that you want. Now, a better way to do it is to actually use the multiple levels that we got in the patient to use individualized pharmacokinetics to calculate the AUC. For doing this, we can consider two areas. So the first area is the area during the infusion phase. So AUC, INF, this is the first area. So for one dose, and this is basically using a trapezoidal rule. So you, you can imagine that this is a trapezoid and you're calculating um, the area for that trapezoid. So peak plus trough divided by two times the time of infusion. So going from this point to this point will basically give you the height of trapezoid if you consider this the, you know, a, fl a flipped trapezoid, so to speak. And then you have the first base and the second base uh, which you can add together and divide by two. And that would give you basically mathematically the area uh, during the infusion. And then you need to calculate the second area, which is during the elimination phase, um, which of course also includes the, the um, you know, distribution phase. Uh, but the AUC elimination phase is peak minus trough divided by K constant. And the, the, again, K is calculated uh, from the two levels that we got from the patient. And then you basically add these two, so they will give you the AUC for one dose. And then to get the AUC for uh, a 24 hour period, because this is AUC zero to 24, you basically have to multiply by 24 divided by tau. For example, if your tau is eight, because you're giving the dose every eight hours, 24 divided by eight would be three. So basically you multiply this AUC by three, so that will give you the AUC for a 24 hour period. On the other hand, if you're dosing it every 24 hours, your tau is 24, so th this basically gets uh, canceled out. So uh, these two areas will give you the AUC. Now, another thing that you can do, which is actually what the new 2019 IDSA guidelines are um, actually recommending, is to use the Bayesian approach. So now there are Bayesian software that are becoming uh, pretty readily available and affordable. Bayesian software actually uses adaptive model that fits your patient with very high accuracy. And they can, and these models can either use a single level or it could use two levels. So using two levels is more accurate, but nevertheless, even a single vancomycin level is very accurate in, uh, in predicting AUC. Uh, Bayesian approach actually uh, uses the Bayes theorem it quantifies the sequential relationship between the estimated probability distribution of an individual's patient pharmacokinetic parameters, so such as volume of distribution and clearance. So, so, and, and this is referred to as Bayesian prior. So the Bayesian prior basically uses population pharmacokinetics. So basically the things we did to calculate volume of distribution and clearance, 
uh, to estimate what the patient's volume of distribution and clearance would be uh, empirically. And then once you get the vancomycin level, you know, either two levels or one level, you put them in the Bayesian model. And then from these two, you, you get the Bayesian posterior. So it basically revises that probability distribution that was uh, population kinetics to adapt the model to the patient. And this allows AUC estimation and it is very accurate. So I imagine that over the next few years, um, you know, more and more hospitals will adapt Bayesian software. Uh, you know, there are ways to build this software um, into Epic or other systems. Um, there are also uh, web-based uh, versions of Bayesian software that can be used. Uh, so over the years, we will see more and more of Bayesian uh, approach being utilized. Now, one last thing that I want to talk about is vancomycin uh, continuous infusion. So if you were to, you know, with intermittent infusion, I showed you that you can estimate what the AUC would be from the trough. Now, if you do a continuous infusion, uh, if you start from uh, zero and you, you know, you basically, you infuse the vancomycin dose over 24 hours. So you basically increase the time of infusion all the way to 24 hours. So within 24 hours, you actually get to the steady state. So you go from zero to 24 and then at 24, you get a flat line because you're continuously infusing it over time. So then you don't get the peak and trough. You just get the flat line. So if you get the level at any time, that level is a random level, but it's also your peak and trough. So if you were to get the level of 20, your area is, you're no longer estimating what the AUC would be. The AUC, the AUC would be exactly 20 times 24, which is 480, because you don't have the peak and troughs anymore. This is a continuous infusion. Now the problem with continuous infusion is during the first 24 hours, it took a very long time to get to this. So you were under dosing for the first 24 hours. Uh, which can be fixed by giving a loading dose. So, you know, if if you were to just do the continuous infusion without the loading dose, you get this. If you do a single loading dose, that's the graph that you get. And then you do a loading dose and your continuous infusion, then you get this peak here. And then after 24 hours, uh, you get a flat line. So that would be uh, uh, the best approach to get the right AUC. Now, however, there are advantages and disadvantages to continuous infusion. Uh, so advantages would be that uh, it's effective uh, PKPD target attainment, uh, potentially less nephrotoxicity because you don't get those high levels of um, vancomycin in there. You don't get those high peaks. Uh, it basically becomes once a day dosing because you're infusing it over 24 hours. So it's literally you change the bag every 24 hours. In fact, because you only do this every 24 hours and infuse it over 24 hours, this is oftentimes used uh, outpatient. So it's convenient for outpatient parenteral antibiotic therapy or OPAT. Now the disadvantage is that, you know, a vascular line will be busy all day. So if you wanted to administer other an an antibiotics or other medications, really, uh, a line would be taken. And uh, ultimately, uh, we haven't, uh, you know, studies have not shown a clear evidence of improved efficacy over uh, conventional uh, intermittent dosing. And the 2020 ASHP IDSA vancomycin guideline recommends uh, continuous infusion may be a reasonable alternative to conventional intermittent infusion dosing when the AUC target cannot be achieved. So if you know, if you keep getting levels and you cannot achieve the AUC, then continuous infusion uh, might be able to help you achieve those targets. Uh, if so, especially in critically ill patients, a loading dose of 15 to 20 milligram per kilo is recommended, followed by a daily maintenance continuous infusion of 30 to 40 milligram per kilo. And this is to achieve a steady state level of uh, between 20 to 25 milligram. Um, and this doesn't matter once you're at steady state, it doesn't matter if it's a random level because you know your peak trough and random are the same level. 